I didn't mean to kill Austin. Ashley, I really didn't. I really think I did. I didn't mean to hurt him. Witnessing kids react to life sentences evokes a spectrum of emotions, from confusion to solemnity. Surprisingly, numerous cases exist where children committed such heinous crimes that they were tried and sentenced to life imprisonment. Therefore, understanding their reactions sheds light on the complexities of justice and the human capacity for empathy in the face of harsh realities. Some children expressed regret for their actions, while others displayed lack of empathy. Here are 10 kids reacting to life imprisonment. Nehemiah Grigo the dark and disturbing story of Nehemiah Grigo, a 15-year-old boy who committed a mass shooting that claimed the lives of five members of his own family. On the night of January 19, 2013, Nehemiah unleashed unimaginable horror as he shot and killed his parents and three younger siblings. The details of this tragic event sent shockwaves through the nation, leaving everyone questioning how such a young individual could commit such a heinous act. Nehemiah was a teenager living a seemingly ordinary life, but beneath the surface, there were troubling signs that hinted at the darkness lurking within him. As a young boy, Nehemiah grew up in a family that appeared to be like any other. His parents, Greg and Sarah Grigo, worked hard to provide for their children, creating a loving and stable environment. Nehemiah had three younger siblings, a brother and two sisters, who were innocent and full of life. However, as Nehemiah entered his teenage years, his behavior started to take a dark turn. He began to exhibit signs of anger, isolation, and a fascination with violence. Friends and family members noticed a change in his demeanor as he became more withdrawn and distant. It was during this time that Nehemiah's trouble path began to unfold. While the exact reasons behind Nehemiah's descent into darkness may never be fully understood, there were several factors that likely contributed to his transformation. One significant factor was his exposure to violence and substance abuse within his family. It is believed that he battled with depression, anxiety, and feelings of isolation, which may have intensified his anger and fueled his desire for control and power. On that fateful night of January 19, 2013, Nehemiah's inner demons took control, and he committed the unthinkable. Armed with two different weapons, weapons, a .22 rifle, and an AR-15 type semi-automatic rifle. First, he targeted his mother, Sarah, shooting her with the .22 rifle. Then he turned his attention to his younger brother, whose life was cut short by a single gunshot. Finally, Nehemiah took the lives of his two younger sisters, but the horror didn't end there. Nehemiah waited for his father, Greg, to return home, and when he did, he was met with a barrage of bullets from the AR-15 rifle. After the terrible act, Nehemiah's actions took an even more chilling turn. He calmly drove to church with the two rifles still in the van and told his girlfriend that his family had died in an accident. It was only through the intuition and quick thinking of the pastor and a retired homicide detective that the truth began to unravel. As a minor at the time of the crime, there was a proposal to sentence him in a family court given his age. However, this decision was appealed and he was ultimately sentenced as an adult in October 2015. Eric Smith The emotions were not extreme at all. It was his conduct that was extreme. The nine-year-old freckle-faced teenager confessed to the brutal murder of four-year-old Derek Roby. Born with fiery red hair and a face dotted with freckles, Eric seemed like an ordinary child growing up in the quiet town of Savona, New York. However, those who knew him closely would soon discover a pattern of bizarre and troubling actions that hinted at a darkness lurking within. Eric displayed a disturbing incident that would foreshadow the horrors to come. One day, he used a clamp from a vacuum cleaner to slowly strangle a cat to death. This act of cruelty shocked those who witnessed it, but it was only the beginning of a series of troubling incidents that would unfold in Eric's life. One chilling incident involved Eric burning his own face with a lit cigarette while his friend slept nearby. The reasons behind these acts remained a mystery, but they hinted at a deep-seated anger and a lack of control. The combination of his troubled home life, his physical appearance, and the constant torment from his classmates created a perfect storm within Eric. It was within this storm that a mental disease began to take hold, a rage disorder that consumed him and led him down a path of unimaginable violence. At first, Eric Eric denied any involvement in Derek's murder, but under the relentless questioning of investigators, he confessed. I was there when my grandson confessed. Eric had enticed Derek into a secluded wooded area not far from his home. There, he subjected the innocent child to a brutal strangulation and merciless beating with rocks. The defense team would later argue that Eric suffered from intermittent explosive disorder, a psychiatric condition characterized by uncontrollable outbursts of anger and violence. Renowned psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Herman testified that Eric had confided in him, expressing his need to release his anger and hurt others. Eric's confession to the murder of Derek Roby revealed the depths of his rage and the extent to which he was 
willing to go to satisfy his violent impulses. While his defense team argued that his mental disease rendered him incapable of controlling his actions, the prosecution maintained that Eric's conduct was extreme and that he should be held responsible for his heinous crime. Ultimately, the jury found Eric guilty of murder in the second degree, and he was sentenced to a minimum of five years to life in prison. Lionel Tate it was July 28th when 12-year-old Lionel Tate found himself at the center of a crime that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Tate, known for his love of wrestling, was spending the day with 6-year-old Tiffany Eunuch, a family friend. What started as innocent play soon took a devastating turn. As the two children engaged in roughhousing, Tate attempted to imitate wrestling moves he had seen on television. But in a horrifying twist of fate, his actions resulted in severe injuries for young Tiffany. Tiffany suffered a fractured skull, lacerated liver, and broken ribs, injuries that no child should ever endure. The prosecution argued that Tate's actions were intentional, claiming that he had shown a complete disregard for Tiffany's life. The defense, on the other hand, maintained that it was a tragic accident, a case of a young boy's misguided play gone terribly wrong. As the trial progressed, the jury was faced with the difficult task of determining Tate's guilt or innocence. Finally, after weeks of deliberation, Lionel Tate was found guilty of first-degree murder. The severity of the charge was unprecedented for someone of Tate's age, and the implications of the verdict were staggering. Carrying a mandatory life sentence, many observers were hopeful that Judge Joel Levinson might find a legal loophole and hand down a lighter sentence. However, that was not to be the case. The judge's hands were tied by the statute, which stated that a condition for murder in the first degree is a mandatory life sentence. The impact of the verdict was far-reaching. Even some members of the jury began questioning the trial's outcome, wondering if justice had truly been served. Nora Jeff, Russell's wife, expressed her disappointment, stating that the sentence was not helping society or Lionel himself. Prosecutor Ken Padowitz, too, felt that the sentence was too harsh, openly admitting that he found life in prison without parole inappropriate for a young teenager. But Judge Levinson defended his ruling, pointing out that his hands were tied by the law. He had no options but to follow the statute, regardless of his personal beliefs or the public sentiment. His loyalty was to the law, and he remained steadfast in his decision. Despite the emotional pleas from Tate's defense team and the growing public sympathy, the judge had no choice but to adhere to the law. The ruling stunned not only the courtroom, but the entire nation. Lionel Tate, at just 14 years old, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He became one of the youngest American ever to receive such a severe sentence, a fact that would continue to spark controversy and debate for years to come. Dylan Shoemaker I was trying to do something that my father did. Outside the courthouse, he remained mostly silent, but inside, he displayed visible emotions, shedding tears as he pleaded not guilty. Dylan Shoemaker, a young man from Buffalo, New York, found himself at the center of a horrifying incident that would forever change the lives of those involved. At just 16 years old, Shoemaker was entrusted with the care of his girlfriend's child. Dylan had significant behavioral problems growing up, which included aggression and anger issues. I am a 16-year-old blonde. Probably all I have to do is cry in front of the jury and they're going to feel sorry for me. On the day of the tragedy, Dylan was entrusted with the care of his girlfriend's young son, Austin. What should have been a routine babysitting task turned into a nightmare that no one could have anticipated. As the hours passed, something inside Dylan snapped. The weight of responsibility and the pressures of his troubled past became too much for him to bear. In a moment of unimaginable rage, he unleashed a wave of violence upon the innocent toddler. The details of the crime are haunting. Dylan, overwhelmed by his emotions, placed a pillow over Austin's head, obstructing his ability to breathe. The defenseless child struggled for air, his tiny body writhing in fear and pain. But Dylan's brutality did not end there. He repeatedly punched Austin with such force that it caused severe internal injuries, including bleeding on the brain. The little boy's cries for help went unanswered, drowned out by the echoes of Dylan's anger. Austin's pleas for mercy fell on deaf ears as the relentless assault continued. The room, once filled with innocence and laughter, became a scene of unspeakable horror. When the violence finally subsided, Austin lay motionless on the bed, his small body battered and bruised. Tubes protruded from his blue lips, a desperate attempt to save his life. But it was too late. The damage inflicted upon him was irreversible. In the end, the verdict was delivered, and Dylan Shoemaker was found guilty of murder in the second degree. Dylan, now 17 years old, was sentenced to an indeterminate term of imprisonment, with a minimum sentence of 25 years. Evan Miller Evan Miller, at the tender age of 14, embarked on a path that would forever change his life. Now he seeks a reconsideration of his sentence. On that fateful summer night in July 2003, a series of events unfolded that would ultimately lead to the brutal murder of Cole Cannon. It all began with a seemingly innocent act of theft, as Evan Miller and Colby Smith set their sights on Cole's prized possession, his collection of valuable baseball cards. Cole, a passionate collector and former owner of a baseball card shop, had recently moved to the country living trailer 
Park. Unbeknownst to him, his new neighbors, Evan and Colby, had their eyes on his valuable collection. They saw an opportunity to make a quick buck and devised a plan to steal the cards. Late in the afternoon on July 15, 2003, while Cole was using the Miller's telephone, Evan and Colby seized the moment and sneaked into his trailer. They pilfered through his belongings, carefully selecting the most valuable baseball cards. As the evening progressed, Cole continued to use Miller's phone, unaware of the theft that had taken place just a few feet away. In the late hours of the night, fueled by a mix of alcohol and a growing sense of malevolence, Evan and Colby returned to Cole's trailer. The atmosphere was tense, and a confrontation was inevitable. According to Evan's later account, the evening took a dark turn when Cole became heavily intoxicated, stumbling and falling, injuring his nose and lip on a table. In this moment of vulnerability, a violent altercation erupted. Evan claimed that Cole grabbed him by the throat, prompting Colby to intervene, pushing Cole away. In a desperate struggle for control, Evan was struck on the arm by Cole, while Colby managed to wrestle the bat away from him. The bat was then discarded, hidden under a couch. Evan unleashed a barrage of punches on Cole's defenseless face. In the midst of the chaos, Evan noticed Cole's wallet lying on the floor, tempting him with the promise of quick cash. He seized the opportunity, taking around $1.300 in cash and Cole's driver's license. The true horror of that night was yet to be discovered. The following morning, firefighters were called to the trailer park to extinguish a fire at Cole's trailer. As they battled the flames, they noticed blood spatters on the coffee table and walls, a grim indication that something far more sinister had taken place. The investigation was handed over to investigator Tim Sandlin of the Sheriff's Department, who meticulously pieced together the events of that horrific night. The evidence pointed to a premeditated act of violence, fueled by greed and a disturbing sense of power. The stolen baseball cards, the stolen wallet, the blood-soaked crime scene, all pointed to the cold-blooded murder of Cole Cannon. Evan and Colby's actions were not those of misguided youth, but of individuals capable of unspeakable cruelty. The jury, faced with the weight of the evidence, found Evan guilty of capital murder. Circuit Judge Philip Reich, presiding over the trial, sentenced 17-year-old Evan Miller to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Thomas T.J. Lane. During his trial, Lane displayed a lack of remorse for his actions. Born on September 19, 1994, he grew up in a tumultuous environment marked by instability and dysfunction. Lane's troubled upbringing, coupled with a history of prior offenses, painted a disturbing picture of a young man spiraling out of control. Lane's criminal record revealed a pattern of aggression and violence. He had a history of assault and had been involved in altercations with others. His target, Russell King, was one of the victims of the shooting. Lane had previously threatened to fight King, and their animosity had been festered for some time. On that fateful day, tensions reached a boiling point. Lane entered Chardon High School with a stolen Ruger MK III .22 caliber semi-automatic handgun, a weapon he had obtained from his uncle. As Lane made his way to the cafeteria, he targeted the table where Russell King and other students were seated, unleashing a hail of bullets upon his unsuspecting victims. Lane's guilty plea marked a turning point in the legal proceedings. The courtroom was filled with tension and disbelief as he made offensive remarks and wore a shirt with an inappropriate message. Throughout the legal proceedings, proceedings, Lane's competency was evaluated to determine his mental state. It was crucial to establish whether he fully understood the consequences of his actions and could be held accountable for them. Ultimately, he was found competent to stand trial, paving the way for the legal process to move forward. The legal process surrounding the shooting at Chardon High School was fraught with tension and emotion. The families of the deceased students sought justice for their loved ones, filing wrongful death suits against the Chardon School District and Lake Academy Alternative School. However, these suits were later dismissed, prompting the family to appeal the decision. In addition to the legal battles with the school district, the families also filed suits against Lane's family. These suits were eventually settled for nearly $2.7 million, providing some financial compensation for the immense loss they had endured. Finally, the day of reckoning arrived. The judge, taking into account the severity of Lane's crime and his lack of remorse, delivered a verdict that would ensure he would never walk free again. Lane was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Aiden Fucci we pray all the time, and I just hope you consider it a little bit. Please don't take him out of our lives forever. Fucci's sentencing was a solemn moment as the judge handed down a life imprisonment sentence. The gravity of the crime, the lack of remorse, and the cold, calculated nature of the act left no room for leniency. On May 9, 2021, Tristan Bailey, a 13-year-old cheerleader, was brutally murdered by her 14-year-old schoolmate, Aiden Fucci. The details of this tragic event are both shocking and disturbing. Tristan's body, stabbed 114 times, was found in a secluded wooded area near St. John's. As the
the sun set on May 9, 2021, the Bailey family's Mother's Day celebration took a devastating turn. Tristan Bailey, a beloved 13-year-old cheerleader, was reported missing by her family in the early hours of the day. Panic and fear gripped the community as the search for Tristan began. Hours later, a resident made a gruesome discovery in a wooded area near St. John's. Tristan's lifeless body, bearing 114 stab wounds, was found. Tristan's family, friends, and the community at large were left to grapple with the aftermath of this tragedy. The void left by her absence was immeasurable and the pain endured by her loved ones was indescribable. On the midnight of May 10th, police descended upon Fuchi's house, searching for evidence. In his room, they made a disturbing discovery, bloody clothes, and a sheath that matched the knife found near Tristan's body. During the sentencing, the court acknowledged the profound impact this crime had on the community. The judge emphasized the extraordinary nature of the crime, highlighting the 114 stab wounds inflicted upon Tristan, the defensive wounds indicating her desperate struggle for survival, and the chilling premeditation exhibited by Aiden Fuchi. In February 2023, just before his trial was set to begin, Fuchi made a shocking decision. He changed his plea from not guilty to guilty, admitting his responsibility for Tristan's murder. The courtroom was filled with tension and emotion as Judge R. Lee Smith delivered the verdict. He described the crime as cold, calculated, and premeditated, emphasizing that there was no motive other than Fuchi's internal desire to experience the act of killing. The overwhelming evidence against Fuchi, coupled with his subsequent guilty plea, only deepened the horror of the crime. Fuchi was arrested for second-degree murder, but as the investigation progressed, the charges were upgraded to first-degree murder. I adjudicate you guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. Fuchi's age made him eligible for a case review after 25 years, but the weight of his actions would forever be etched in the memory of the community. Mackenzie Sherilla. Her actions were controlled, methodical, deliberate, intentional, and purposeful. Mackenzie Sherilla's car crash, which took the lives of her boyfriend Dominic Russo and their friend Davin Flanagan, was no ordinary accident. It was a deliberate act of violence that would forever change the lives of those involved. Surveillance footage captured the chilling moments leading up to the crash. Mackenzie's car, speeding down the road at an alarming 100 miles per hour, suddenly veered off course, crashing into a building with a force that seemed unimaginable. The impact was devastating, instantly claiming the lives of Dominic and Davin. As the investigation unfolded, it became it became clear that this was no mere accident. Mackenzie's actions were intentional, a deliberate act of violence that would forever haunt the families of the victims. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that this was no mere accident. Mackenzie's actions were intentional, a deliberate act of violence that would forever haunt the families of the victims. Prosecutors presented evidence that painted a chilling picture of Mackenzie's mindset leading up to the crash. The trial that followed was a harrowing experience for all involved. Mackenzie opted for a bench trial, placing her fate in the hands of Judge Nancy. Nancy Margaret Russo, known for her tough stance on crime. The courtroom was filled with grief-stricken family members, their hearts heavy with loss and a thirst for justice. Throughout the trial, the prosecution meticulously laid out the evidence, leaving no doubt as to Mackenzie's guilt. Witnesses testified to Mackenzie's reckless behavior leading up to the crash, showcasing her disregard for the lives of those around her. The prosecutor's closing arguments left no room for doubt. They painted a vivid picture of Mackenzie's callousness and disregard for human life. They reminded the court that a failed suicide attempt is not a defense to murder, and that Mackenzie's actions had resulted in the deaths of two young men. Finally, it was Mackenzie's turn to address the court. Her statement was brief, filled with apologies and expressions of sorrow. She professed her love for Dominic and Davin, claiming that they were all friends and that Dominic was her soulmate. Mackenzie's words were met with a mix of skepticism and grief from the families of the victims. Judge Russo, after carefully considering all the evidence and testimonies, delivered her verdict. She sentenced Mackenzie Sherilla to 15 years to life for the intentional murders of Dave and Flanagan and Dominic Russo. Danta Wright. I just want to tell y'all. I'll be home soon. R.I.P. Keon. I love my family. Born and raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the 17-year-old boy grew up in a neighborhood plagued by crime and poverty. From a young age, he found himself drawn into a world of illicit activities, seeking solace and belonging in the wrong crowd. As he entered his teenage years, his involvement in criminal behavior escalated. Wright's first brush with the law came in the form of armed robbery. He became entangled in a series of robberies targeting local businesses, displaying a brazen disregard for the consequences of his actions. The thrill of the illicit and the allure of 
quick money seemed to cloud his judgment, but it was the conspiracy to commit armed robbery that marked a turning point in Wright's criminal trajectory. He became deeply involved in a network of individuals planning and executing high-stakes robberies. The allure of the criminal lifestyle and the promise of financial gain proved too tempting for Wright to resist. However, it was during one of these planned robberies that the unthinkable occurred. In a tragic twist of fate, Wright's actions took a dark and irreversible turn. He found himself faced with a choice that would forever change the lives of those involved. On that fateful day, Wright crossed paths with Jordan Cleef, a high school student who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Armed with a firearm, Wright approached Cleef from behind, his intentions unknown. In a moment of sheer brutality, he shot Cleef in the back of the head. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that Wright's troubled past and his involvement in criminal activities played a significant role in the events that transpired. The trial that unfolded in the Washtenaw County Trial Court in Ann Arbor, Michigan, was an emotionally charged affair, leaving no one untouched by the tragedy. The victim's mother, overcome with grief and anger, took the stand to deliver a powerful victim impact statement. Her words reverberated through the courtroom as she addressed Wright directly, questioning how he could have felt the need to murder her son. I no longer have the hope of having grandchildren. I've lost the enjoyment of holidays and birthdays and of everyday life. Throughout the proceedings, Wright's demeanor raised eyebrows and fueled speculation. He was seen smiling, laughing and shaking his head, seemingly unaffected by the gravity of his actions. After much deliberation, Wright was sentenced to 25 to 52 years behind bars. Philip Chisholm in 2013, when Chisholm was just 14 years old, his family relocated to Danvers, Massachusetts, seeking a fresh start. Little did they know that this move would be the catalyst for a horrifying chain of events. Born on February 1, 1999, in Clarksville, Tennessee, he grew up in a middle-class family with his parents and two siblings. His childhood appeared unremarkable, with no signs of the darkness that would later consume him. Chisholm enrolled at Danvers High School, where he encountered his maths teacher, Colleen Ritzer. As the school year progressed, Chisholm's behavior began to exhibit signs of trouble. He became increasingly withdrawn, displaying a lack of interest in his studies and a growing detachment from his peers. On October 22, 2013, Chisholm's troubled state of mind reached its breaking point. It was a seemingly ordinary day with students and teachers going about their routines. But behind Chisholm's calm facade, a storm was brewing. That afternoon, after school had ended for the day, Chisholm approached Colleen Ritzer, his maths teacher, in the hallway. In a horrifying act of violence, Chisholm raped, strangled, and stabbed his unsuspecting teacher. After committing the the heinous act, Chisholm attempted to conceal the evidence of his crime. He disposed of Ritzer's body in a wooded area near the school, hoping to erase any trace of his dark deed. But the truth would not remain hidden for long. When Ritzer failed to return home that evening, her family grew concerned. They reported her missing, setting off a frantic search for the beloved teacher. The community rallied together, hoping for her safe return. Authorities discovered Ritzer's lifeless body in the wooded area near the school. The shock and grief that swept through Danvers were immeasurable. As the investigation unfolded, all eyes turned to Philip Chisholm. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and he was quickly apprehended by law enforcement. The community grappled with the realization that a fellow student, a seemingly ordinary teenager, could commit such a heinous act. The trial that followed would be a test of justice and accountability. The prosecution presented a compelling case, highlighting the premeditation and brutality of Chisholm's actions. The defense, on the other hand, sought to paint a picture of a troubled young boy, arguing for a chance at rehabilitation. As the trial came to a close, the judge was faced with the weighty task of determining Chisholm's fate. Philip Chisholm would spend the rest of his life behind bars with the possibility of parole in 25 years. That's all we have for you. If you enjoyed this video and would love to watch more, then stay updated by clicking on any of the cards on your screen.